Hello, and welcome to the Black Lives Matter radio show. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, the founder of Incandescent Incorporated, a PR firm and publishing company where we are thrilled to just bring voices to all, all of our listeners. So tonight, Tony Farmer is our host, of course, every Sunday night, 6 p.m. Eastern, and we could not be happier than to have Jamia Crockett on our show. She is the new CEO of, let me get this right, Families Forward Virginia. And we're yes. going to learn all about that. She holds a degree from William and Mary, a master's in hospital administration from VCU. She has worked in health systems in Virginia and North Carolina, moving her career forward in strategic planning and business development to her most recent position. In the last 14 years, she has made it her personal mission to empower community members to become stakeholders in their own health. And now, as we always do, I'm going to throw it over to Tony to have our beautiful conversation. Enjoy. Thank you, Hope, and thank you, Jamia, for joining us on the Black Lives Matter radio show this evening. We're so excited to have you. And I was just kind of chatting with you before we started. Uh, we do you know, a, a fair amount of research on our guests, and I always kind of like to tee things up. I always like to keep it fun and keep it light, but we're going to touch on some pretty deep topics as well. The first thing I want to do is let you know that there's some connection. You and I are family. You didn't know that but you and I are family and here's how that works. My sister-in-law graduated from William and Mary as well. Wow. And so we are, we have family in Williamsburg and, and we go through that area quite a bit. We vacation there many times. And so it, we consider it a second home. So any graduate of William and Mary is a friend of ours and we adopt you into our family. Well, it's good so I want to jump right in. Yes, you you so at the next family reunion you got the cornbread. And I got the cornbread with a little <laughs> bit of corn in there. If you make it that way, you gotta put a little cream of corn in the I love cornbread. It. I love it. Syrup. Yeah. That's old school right there. So yeah. let's jump right in. One of the things that I noted from your background is that you come from uh, healthcare. And I want to hear your thoughts on the vaccine, how it's going, the pandemic how it's impacted people in your community and some of the things that you've done in your space to deal with the pandemic overall? Well, that's a great question. So being in healthcare and being in my current position as a community benefits manager, it's really my job to educate and give resources to the most vulnerable in our communities around any kind of health topic that exists. And of course, in this pandemic, we've been very focused around how do we get the message about how to stay safe at home what does it look like to quarantine at home, masking, washing your hands, the prevalence of now the disease, pretty much COVID is everywhere. And so understanding how we can navigate in this space has been really top of mind um, for me as far as looking at the community data. Um, I work out um, kind of east of Richmond, or, you know, really west of Richmond, so small community. So when we get a new case, it, that's a big deal. Like it's one person, but it's like the person on your block is now been in, in, you know, impacted. So a lot of times when I'm with my children, it's like every time we leave the house, it's put your mask on. Do we have hand sanitizer? We're going to do the drive through to get the groceries. We're not going inside. We can't play with our friends. And it's been a difficult, you know, transition. Um, but I think when you think about your health, we have to do these things. And, you know, as in our community, we love to be together. We love to go to church. I'm calling my mother like, mom, I can't go to ch church. I understand right, that Jesus right. will meet you where you right. are. So let's be safe and do virtual. Let's just try it. Let's just see if we can do virtual church. And, you know, the first, it was a little resistance because that's not what she's familiar with. You know, we want to mm -hmm. be in church. we got to hear the pastor. And now people have been very creative using Zoom to do their church services, of course, virtual online, even some drive in, like you go into the church parking lot. So you stay in your cars to still hear the word and you can still kind of be in community, but still being safe. Um, that's been a lot of what I've been focusing on, especially in our Black and Brown communities, the prevalence is high. Not only are we catching it faster, we're dying from it. And so matching those two things up is like, we have to be safe and we have to have to prevent. And we prevent when we social distance. We prevent when we do the Zoom calls and still the family birthday gathering. We're all in the same house with grandma. We, we just, we should not do that. We can be safer now we've got more information now and so i've been really just preaching that as far as anyone who will listen they know i'm like the covid girl the covid lady of the block because they're like well, what's going on and i'm like well guys <laughs> cases are still high so we need to talk 
across the street, I need to see your mask on. I'm gonna have my mask on. Um, so I've kind of gotten that um, I'm the COVID lady on the block because they wanna know what's going on, they're gonna ask me. And I've been fortunate enough to have good information to share. And with the vaccine coming out, I've already had my first dose. Um, we all need it. Let's let's just educate and be educated around the choices and resources that are available so that we can stay safe and kind of crush this pandemic where it stands. So you said something that stood out to me. Uh, there's an old colloquialism that when society catches a cold, the black and brown catch pneumonia. And so now with the presence of the vaccine mm -hmm. and there's so many dueling reports on who's supposed to be taken, where it's being distributed, where it's not being distributed, yeah. the Pfizer versus the Moderna. If you were had an opportunity, and you do at this moment, just to talk to the black and brown brothers and sisters out there, what is your advice on whether to take the vaccine or not? So I strongly recommend that we take the vaccine because we're already predisposed to have kind of like giving things like, you know, we get the, the cold versus the pneumonia. So we, we already have a lot of underlying chronic conditions. It's already wearing our immune system down. You put a disease like COVID on top and it's like the perfect storm for the worst outcomes imaginable. So what I've been showing, sharing with my community when we go and do our COVID screening and we're trying to get our brothers and sisters out just to get screened, just to find out what's your status right now. Um, you're like, well, what about the vaccine? As soon as you're able to get it, let's get it. As far as the difference between Pfizer and the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna, they're pretty much the same you know, chemically, right? It's, it's just, it, it works. You could do the Pfizer or the, the Moderna. You, you know we can't mix them right now, um, but if you do the Pfizer, it's just as good as if you do the Moderna. I got the Moderna. That's just what came up. It, when it was my time to go in, that's what came up. So the really clinically, there's no difference. It's just how it was packaged how you need to store it, when you need to come back for your second dose. But really, as far as the efficacy, they are the same. They really are very safe and great. And we should be, and when you're able to get into those groupings, we should do it. Because now it's not just our health or my health, it's everyone's health. And we want to be around for our children and grandchildren. We don't want to say COVID was a reason why, you know, aunt so-and-so is not here. And that's already happened. We, you know, we're already mm -hmm. in the whole 400,000 Americans already passing. Um, and it's not slowing up anytime soon. So the vaccine is important. It's not going to make you grow another eyeball. And I know in our community, we're a little hesitant because of, of our past, right? We, we have a lot of historical trauma with not trusting the medical community. And me being a black woman in the medical community, I can say that this is, this is a wise choice. Like if you're able to do it, we should do it and just get that vaccine and just trust there's that. One more thing, mm -hmm. There's one more thing that I really want to bring out. Uh, and, and I thank you so much for expounding on the differences and the similarities and, mm -hmm. and pushing to make sure that you get vaccinated no matter who you are, where you are, particularly those who are 60 and above. But there's one more myth that I want you to debunk. There's one more thing that I believe it's caused confusion in the community. And now that we have our first healthcare professional on our show that can speak to it directly, talk to people about herd immunity, what that means, what it doesn't mean, the myths around it, and, and how that impacts our communities. So the idea around herd immunity is if someone has a certain, let's say germ, just to keep it kind of as simple as possible, and then that germ can go from body to body to body. At some point we'll all have it and then our body will then respond to that germ and then start building immunity to fight that germ. And so at some point the germ will just kind of quote, go away. So I'm kind of talking to like I talk to my kids like this is because it gets a little scientific and, and then you lose people. So if everyone has the germ and then our bodies kind of ramp up a response to fight that germ, at some point then the germ goes away and, and our bodies have now responded to it in a positive way like okay, my immune system has recognized this germ and now it's fought the germ, the germ is gone. And then as over time, it'll be gone amongst a greater group. Right now with COVID, it's kind of like the reverse. COVID is just jumping from person to person, to person, to person, to person. And it's and right now our bodies are not able to ramp up the immunity that we need yet. 
So that's why it's like, if you go outside, you pretty much can get COVID, right? Like it's just so pervasive at this point that our bodies have not been able to ramp up enough antibodies to fight that COVID germ. So we're not there yet. So the herd immunity thing is a scientific phenomenon. It does happen. But right now, unfortunately, we're not in that space to do that. People are dying before those antibodies can really ramp up to then be shared to other people. So the thought is if we get the vaccine and we start building up those immunities now, at some point, enough of us will be vaccinated, our bodies will then share those germs and then those germs will then fight the COVID germ once it comes back. But that's a long haul. That's a long runway at this point. And then with the COVID mutating, the virus mutating to, to be even more prevalent, our bodies, you know, we're just we're just trying to fight it. So the best way we can do that is stay at home, you know, stay at home, social distance, keep your mask on, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and do those things so we give our bodies enough time to build up those antibodies so that we can fight it in the future. But the first step right now is to really get that vaccine. We can't, we won't just develop herd immunity by by natural selection. It's just it's too fast and we don't have enough time. Our bodies are not ramping up at enough pace to fight it to then share that new information to other germs and so forth. So we've, we've got a long haul. So really at this point, get the vaccine, go back for that second dose, let your bodies build up the antibody naturally. And then over time, we would have enough herd immunity. But right now you're not gonna get herd immunity tomorrow or next week yeah. or next month, or maybe not even months and months and months. And I'm not a science, epi I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm a community educator, but that's right. you know how we, that's how I've been explaining that to my peers and my coworkers and family around the idea of herd immunity. It is a scientific phenomenon. It does happen, but it's not happening anytime soon with COVID, unfortunately. It's, it's just too rampant. One of the other things I want to highlight about your background is when I started reading about mm -hmm. you, the first thing that stood out to me was that you are a CEO. That's a big deal to me. And I feel very honored and humbled to be interviewing a CEO. Tell us about Families Forward in Virginia and what you do as the CEO for that organization? Well, I am very fortunate and humbled to this um, stepping into this role. And so it's super, super brand new. And so um, this is it's a shift, right? Coming from the healthcare education side to now going to more community prevention and wraparound services and support services for families is a slightly shift. So it's what I call like kind of a healthcare adjacent. There is some health underpinnings, but really I'm talking, we're talking about and we'll be focusing on wraparound services for our families as a results to child abuse prevention, um, home visiting programs, using parents as teachers and in, in promoting, you know, teaching healthy parental tools and resources to kind of bring the family up to where it can function at its best. Um, what we know is that when you are in a different social economic status, if you've got different life factors, those things can wear on the fabric of the family. And so what Families for does is that we're kind of like that plug in the middle, like we kind of fill in those gaps with resources and materials and whatever that family needs, we have services to help fill that gap so that no family is left broken, right? We can kind of be resilient, be strong, and then function at our best capacity. So that's kind of an so how this opportunity. Thing. How did this opportunity come about? You started in healthcare, <laughs> And by the way, uh, we didn't read your entire bio, but you've been a professor, you've done uh, leadership training, you, your, your portfolio is impressive. And anybody should, you know, who hears this, this podcast should go out of their way to get on Incandescent Women and Amazing Women to see your story. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and we'll unfold that a little bit. But tell me how these two worlds married for you. So you were in healthcare, and now you're doing community work. Tell, tell me how those connect. Well, what's for you. interesting about life? You kind of start one place and you end in another place. So within my job as a healthcare manager and doing community outreach, our hospitals partner with various not for profits in the community. And one of the programs that I was tasked with when I first took the job as a community benefit manager was we need you, Jamia, to look at programs to see if they're really doing what they say that they're doing for the community. So I was so I had a very keen eye on program efficacy and then outcome. Did your program do what you said it was going to do in this report? So I started going through these reports. And so 
one of the programs that the hospital was partnered with was Healthy Families of the Rappahannock area. So it's kind of a local branch of our home visiting arm. And so it was a great, it was a great report. I was like, whoever is doing that program, I need to know because the report was impeccable. Right. And it showed mm -hmm. these great outcomes for families and the hospital was screening moms at the, at the time they give birth to say, if you think you might need some more services, check this box and we'll have someone walk, walk you through. So after you go home with your baby, someone will come and work with you on helping you just get acclimated with being a new mom or whatever resources you need. So we were helping them screen families in the hospital. So before anyone left to go home, they felt like there was a, a support already baked in with their newborn. And so I evaluated that program, loved it, worked with the program director for a couple of years, still evaluating the success of the program. And she said, you should be on the board. So I'm like, sure, let's do that. I'll be on the board. Right. And so then I was on the board right. at the local level. And it was just, it was a good fit because I, you know, as a healthcare professional, I was able to kind of partner and identify new families and expand the reach in that area. So then she moves on to the state level families board in, in her capacity. And then she comes back a couple of years later. She's like, you know, you should be part of this new board. It's, it's merging. <laughs> we should do it. So I said, sure, why not? And you tell me, I'll do it. So I got on the board and became, a, you know, was part of the steering committee for planning and development because that was kind of my still background. And then I moved on to be a treasurer. And then, you know, when the current CEO now said, you know, I'm ready to move and do something different after a lot of review and talking and like, who could do this? Who could do this? And then I was asked and I said, okay, well, I will. And it just made sense at the time that this would be my next natural progression. And looking at my career and things I've done with leadership in other spaces, it just was like, a, yeah, of course, like, of course I'll do it. And right. um, I'm excited. Like, this is a brand new chapter and I'm ready to see, you know, what lies ahead for Families Forward as we kind of move to that next level. So one of the things uh, that's not lost on me <clears throat> is some of the the vision and some of the areas in Richmond. Once upon a time, my, my wife and I were studying moving to Richmond and, and, yeah. and having a home there. And so some of the challenges uh, as it relates to separation of community in Richmond is not lost on me. Uh, it didn't deter me from you know uh, looking into moving there because I also found that Richmond is rich in culture and it's rich in uh, so many resources and we would have felt comfortable wherever we were. But mm -hmm. tell me about the challenges of <laughs> connecting the communities in a way that everybody is getting educated in a way that is commu uh, connecting the, the uh, or I should say establishing dialogue. Because it sounds to me, or it would mm -hmm. it appear to me that you were smack dab in the middle of those conversations. Am, am I right or wrong? Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right. And it's funny because I'm actually a native from Richmond. Like I grew up on the east end of Richmond. And so it was always, I mean, it was always known if you were a local Richmonder, you were either north of the James or south of the James. Like if you were on the north side, you never crossed the bridge to go to the south side. It was just, you just didn't do it. Like it was just, it was just kind of a, a cultural thing. And then if you're on the east end, there was enough going on there that you didn't have to go to the west end, which was a different area, different social economic you know, bucket of folks. And then you had downtown, another little bucket of folks. And so everyone kind of just have, you know, lived in these little pockets. And so I leave Richmond, go out into the world. I'm in North Carolina for a little bit, you know, now I'm in the town of Orange, so I'm far. But every time I come back, I'm like, well, Richmond's changed. Where is the little corner shop? Now it's regentrified and it's beautiful. And so we're starting to see where the communities are getting closer. And there's definitely been more conversation with other not-for-profits around how do we bring Richmond as a unified Richmond? Like, what does that look like? I mean, my high school was Lee Davis High School. Confederates was the mascot. Right. That tells you exactly kind of how Richmond has been rooted and steeped in kind of a structural sense of separate, separate, you know, separate moments like high school named after Confederate war hero. And you're like, yep. And so I'm running, you know, I used to run track and I was like, I will never put Confederates on my back. Like I can't <laughs> run. I can't be a track runner with Confederates on my, you know, on my jersey. I just can't do it. Like there was some points and I was like, nope, that's not going to work. 
and we kind of petitioned to not have Confederates on our, you know, on some of our, on our jerseys, because you know, as a black person, I was like, I'm already running. I don't want to have Confederates on my back. Like, it just feels weird. I don't know. So we, so it's always been kind of an underlying theme and you kind of just kind of work around and you figure out your space and kind of raise your voice where you can. Um, and so I think coming back um, as a new CEO for Family Sport, extending that dialogue around things that we're all, we all have families. That's the common denominator. We're all part of a family. We all know families. We all have families in whatever capacity that we call. And so what are the, what's the common, the common lot, you know, common knowledge? What is the, the common threads that keep us all together? Because at the end of the day, you want to take care of your family. You want to be valued for the work that you do. You want to do something important and meaningful, whatever that is. And you want to be rewarded and you want to have a good life. So, you know, it's kind of simple things, but the, the depth and what that means and what it looks like for every family is kind of where I would like to see that, you know, kind of the threading of the different communities as we move forward. It's a huge task, but I don't think it can, it, it can be done. It will be done one family at a time. That's, that's I like my goal. It. I like your energy. So <laughs> as you were, have been able to observe the things that happen at the Capitol, and you know some of the things that have happened through the the election process. What questions do you get from your kids? What questions do you get from your communities? You have such an interesting perspective as an advocate, as community leader, as a healthcare professional. What what do you say when those questions pop up? What 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 conjures in your mind? Well, it depends. Like with my boys, they are they've been very political. They they are on the pulse of <laughs> all the cutting edge news. And so sometimes I'm playing with my four year old doing tea parties, and then someone will say, "Ma, did you see that they're you know storming the Capitol?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" And, you know, and, and of course, right now, in, in at least for my twelve year old, he is doing Revolutionary War, so he's all you know. We're looking at some of the historical uh -huh. wars, Civil War, uh -huh. those things. So I'm like, "Storming the Capitol?" I said, "Are you reading that? Is that online? Like, what are you looking at?" And then you're like, oh, that's happening right now. Like we are really looking at this in real time. And so we did have to pause because they were, you know, they were just kind of like, well, they were scared. Cause they were like, could they, you know, could people come marching down our street? And I'm like, I'm gonna say no. And if that happens, we will be safe. We will stay inside. We will have conversation. We will not engage because we don't know. I said, but, and I'm always an and person, like it's, it's something in something else. So I said, what we're seeing is, is a group of people who feel strongly that the current regime should be what it should be. And we know that there's another way. There's a better way to protest. There's a better way to dissent and have arguments. There's a better way to have a discord, right? Without storming the walls and breaking glass and, you know, doing all that happened. Um, on the sixth, and so th it was a tough conversation because they had a lot of more why. Like, why would they do that? Mm. And for my son, who's very, very political in his mind, like I feel like he might be the next president. But he was like, you know, why would they do that to keep black people down? Wow. And I was like, okay. And I, I had to sit there for a minute because I was like, I... and even now thinking about it, I was, I was like, well, and I was like, not all, not all. Not all, some people, this small group of people feel like this is what they want to do to keep black people down. So, but not all people, as it's a right. small set and they are acting completely in a very you know, specific vein of hate and, and confusion and, and emotion that's not indicative of every person. And so but trying to ex you know, expand that for a 12 year old, it was difficult because I had my own emotional, as a mom and as a, you know, as a human being, as an adult, I'm like, this is, ridiculous like what's going on right. so i kind of had to like okay let me frame this in a way that we don't want to vilify anyone like the villains are the villains and we see what they're doing right we can't vilify everybody not everybody feels that way some people not right. everybody and so when i was telling myself what we have to do is be able to listen to hear what's common what's the common thread how can we all work together so that this country is better and what will you do you know 12 year old in your when you get online with your teacher tomorrow, ask right. her, ask her how this right. is similar or different than the Civil War, the Tea Party, and all these other, you know, riots and dissensions that happened over the course of history in our country. Why don't you ask her? So I did kind of punt it back to him to, to do some, some soul searching because I was like, I feel like I'm a little bit out of my depth at this moment and we still have a tea party going on with the yeah. four-year-old. So it was just, um, 
it made me think about what they're seeing as yeah. young people and how that, you know, it, it, they felt bad. They felt angry. They were you know, really confused because they're like, well, what kind of America do we live in if this is what people do? Yeah. And now it's like, it's, it could be better. I said, it will be a better America after this because we have no choice but to be better and learn and try not to be that way and not hate and, and love. And, you know, yeah. so it was, it was a definitely, definitely took me a few moments to gather the appropriate like parent perspective. Cause I had my own personal, like, get them in, you know, I was in a whole different mode. It's just Jamia. <laughs> Right. Mia right. Right. was like what we doing and then I was like and I'm also a mother <laughs> so let me put on my mom hat and, and polish the emotion because I had my own personal you know emotional pull and I, I was very upset yeah. and, and sad and a little fearful you know and so I had to like figure out a way to kind of roll those things up in a way and present to my children something that they could hold on to and then speak to later like they're going to look back on this moment and say well mom said this and so mm -hmm that help so that's one space but with peers and other folks it's, it's it's a lot more it's more raw it's very direct conversation about and what do you think and what's your role especially right. to my my non-black friends it's like how are you going to change how you talk about this moment because you're going to be in circles i'm not going to be in you're going to talk to people that i don't talk to and if you feel this way with me are you still going to feel that way with folks that look like you Yes. at the country club or in the yeah. zoom book meetings <laughs> when you're teeing off in on 18. right when you're doing your virtual you know hole in one golf course what are you how are you talking to your friends and so i did i mean i've had to challenge a few folks in that way to say you're identifying with me because you know me and mm -hmm. i might be the only person of color in your circle and that's fine but i need you to take what i'm experiencing and, and sharing with you and share that same message to the folks that you're with because otherwise it, it will just end with me and you in this conversation yeah. if you don't share that moment and, and share and, and show the humanity or lack thereof in these moments that we've experienced as a country. So, When Barack Obama was elected for the first time, mm -hmm. I had the distinct honor of walking through that entire process with my father-in-law who uh, he's gone on to glory now, but my father-in-law was born during the depression. Uh, my father-in-law was also a career soldier and he left the military, retired from the military after 20 odd years. And then he was in corporate. My father-in-law grew up in a segregated America. Uh, he had to deal with, in a lot of ways, a segregated military. And I remember the look on his face when he saw a black man being inaugurated into the highest office in the land. And I remember the emotion and I really lived through vicariously through his lens mm -hmm. because for me, it was about the force of the machine that was behind Barack Obama and mm -hmm. the force of the language when he spoke about different issues and policies. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get my head wrapped around having a female vice president of color, particularly because I have two daughters. I have two teenage daughters. Tell me what goes on in your mind as a woman who has come up, you know, through education and corporate and healthcare. And I'm sure not all of the roads that you travel were easy, but tell me what conjures in your mind when you see a woman of color being inaugurated at the second highest office in, in our country? Oh, I was it's just like proud. And it, it was almost as if I was there. Like I was Kamala. Like me, me too. I was, I was like, and I too can right. do what she's doing. Like I was so proud. And you know, my daughter who's four, the first thing she said was, she looks like me. She's my best friend, mommy. Wow. And I'm like, yes, she's everyone's best friend, but she's definitely your best friend. But she could, she recognized that this was important. And, um, and she was like, well, I said, well, she's the, she's the first vice president of color, first woman of the United States. And she was like, 
it was just like she heard it and she and she's hyper she's a four year old she's all over the place but for whatever moment we sat there and we watched that inauguration like all of us did but she sat and watched her eyes glued and it was just kind of like she was taking in like this is something that i can do too and for me i was just like yes i felt like i was at church like as soon as you know she came down i was like look at god <laughs> what in me? I felt like she was like my best friend, you know, my sister. I was just so proud. And then it was like, okay, we're finally shifting in big places now. It's, it's not just the grassroots. And there's my dog. Um, it was like, this is big shifts. It's visible to all. Right. And it's like, if she can do it, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. If you can do it, we can do it. Right. And so I just felt like it was just like a catharsis. I was just like totally overwhelmed, totally excited. I had my pearls on and my, my chuck. I got dressed, you know what I'm saying? Yes. This is inauguration yes. day. I am getting dressed in my home, full gear, pearls on and everything for, for, for the inauguration. I'm going to wait for just a moment because the dog is doing something. I love how in this Zoom world, uh, we have this whole Zoom environment, you know, kids walking by and, you know, cats jumping up on the desk. <laughs> it's been, it's been so much of, so much more authentic uh, in our communication when we can talk to people in their own environment and, and not be required to kind of dress it up and, and, um, you know, dress ourselves up so that we have to create an image. One, one of the things that Hope and I have talked about is a term we call code switching. And a lot of people who exist outside of communities of color don't quite understand that, don't quite understand sometimes we have to change the way we emote. We have to change the way we speak. We have to ensure that we're not using any slang or anything. And it's, it really is a brain shift that in, in some ways is, is just seamless. You know, nobody knows. Uh, and I was also talking to another one of my uh, friends and I was telling him kind of the unwritten rules of black men in corporate, you know, some of the really small gestures that we make to each other just for acknowledgement, mm -hmm. right? So, so uh, I, I love that the dog is barking. I, <laughs> that that gives us such so much of a an authentic feel. And uh, <laughs> whatever the dog, I, I'm sure the dog's thinking. Listen, uh, just because mom is on, you know, Zoom doing yeah. uh, interview, this does not impact me. I'm hungry, or I need to get out. Yeah. Things need to oh. stay as normal as possible. Yeah, old boy is the great fierce protector of the house. And if anything moves outside, he's on it. And usually it's just a shadow. But I'm like, you know, that's that's Osiris. Right. But yeah, he's right. calm now. So that's good. I love it. <laughs> as a healthcare professional, as a educator, as a community leader, what are your expectations of the new administration? That's a good question. I think my expectation is to be clear. Whatever your agenda is, Whatever you said you were going to do and you followed all the different rhetoric and all the different promises, just be clear and be consistent. Don't tell me we're going to get rainbows if it's not rainbows. Be authentic. So I'm hopeful that, you know, with the events that happened on the 6th and just some of this, you know, this idea of like spinning the story and these alternate facts and not the full truth. I am looking to hold them accountable about doing what you say you're going to do. Even if it's something, quote, small, then do that and, and, and be clear with what it is. Look at how it's going to impact our country and, and just be clear. I feel like there's been just a lot of hazy, ambiguous pundits and, and just these big general phrases and they like, what does it mean for me on Monday? I'm gonna wake up Monday and do what with what you just said on, you know, at your last state of address. So that's what I'm really looking for. I'm looking for a clarity of, of purpose and intention. Be intentional when you say that my life matters. Be intentional with what that means with changing policy to back that up. Be intentional with making sure that we put infrastructure in place that protects everyone. And so I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. And 
Yeah. That's so I'm, uh, I don't want to. When I'm firmly in coaching brain or coaching mode, I love to ask my clients about future outcomes, what, what they would like to see in future outcomes. And again, as I mentioned, I don't do anything unless I'm having fun doing it. So I'll throw you a question just to have some fun with it, right? Uh, your phone rings, it's the White House. They want you to come to a meeting in Capitol Hill to talk about your program. What do you, what do you say to them? What is the outcome of that meeting? The outcome is that I get funding. I get funding for many, many, many years that make sure that I have programs that will support our families for Virginia, because that's right now, that's my scope. But I, I mean, I need, I need money. I need to make sure that we have secure funding to make sure that all the programs that we have can touch as many families that need it. So that would be my outcome. Because I'm going to say, look, there's 90,000 families in Virginia that could use services that my organization provides. I've got a team of professional folks with over 50 plus years of, of experience in their particular fields. So I need to make sure that I keep funds moving to them so that they can do their best work to make sure that we touch every family. So if I can change that delta from 90,000 to a need of none, that's my outcome. That's what I would go to the White House. And I say, look, Kamala, sister, I got my <laughs> pearls on. You got your pearls on. How can we put it. things in place that families in Virginia get what they need? And then let's work together to, to make this happen. That's yeah, let's go cool. have a meal. Let's sit down. You know, let's 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 go to let's, the parlor if we need to. It's right, let's chop it need. up. Let's you <laughs> tell me what you got. I'm gonna tell you what I need. I'm gonna tell you what I can do. I'm gonna show you the outcomes and, and all the, the data that, that's required to, to prove my point. And then you're gonna do it. Like it's yeah. I'm always like this is the simplest thing to do. Right. So we've yeah. been talking about Kamala and one of the things that's not lost on me regarding your background is that you've taught leadership. If you were to have a group of young women of color uh, across the spectrum, across different cultures and backgrounds, and you wanted to tell, teach them three things about being a leader, a woman of color who is in leadership position, what would your top three things be? That's good. First, think big. Think big. The sky is the limit. The second thing I would say is work hard. Harder than anyone else in the room. And then the, the last thing I would say was have heart. Because if your heart's not in anything, you won't get anything done. That's what I would say. I think, because for me, I'm always like the simplest thing, the simplest answer, the easiest answer usually is the answer. So you work hard, you think big, and you have heart. If you have those things then anything else will line up in such a way that you can accomplish those goals. So if you're not going to work hard, that's already putting you up game. If you're not thinking big, then you're thinking yourself out of something, an opportunity. Right. If you don't have the heart, then what are you doing? Right. I think that's what I'd say. And then, that you know, sense. always have, always look fabulous. Whatever that is for you, <laughs> always have a good pair of shoes. That I do. Is it all about the shoes? No story. It is. And I'm, yeah. I'm a shoe person. I need yeah. that. I can have on sweatpants and still have on a pair of pumps and that's going to, that's just going to be what it is. So <laughs> always have a good sturdy pair of heels. I, I uh, once took a facilitation class and one of the instructors said he used to work with this woman and before every program that she ran, she would stand with her hands up and, you know, kind of do this thing and, and really, that really formed her energy around whatever, yeah. whatever was going to happen throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I, you know, I want to thank you for everything you do in the community. Second of all, I want to commend you for working hard and thinking big and having heart and looking fabulous doing it. I, I want to encourage people who may be watching this podcast or listening to this podcast to pay attention and to really do some homework on Families Forward in Virginia. If somebody wants to support Families Forward in Virginia, tell them what they need to do. Uh, it, it, we don't, you know, hoping I never know who is going to be listening, but 
you know, on the off chance that we have a couple of millionaires or billionaires who are looking to invest in a nonprofit, tell us how they would do it and tell us why they would do it. Well, the simplest answer, of course, is to go to our website, www.familiesforward.org. Um, that's going to kind of be that, that platform, that landing space for you to learn everything that we're up to, all the different programs and, and the reach that we have and the impact that we have um, in the state of Virginia. The reason why someone would want to give is we're talking about pretty much the bedrock of society, right? Families are the bedrock of any society. However, whatever shape and form it takes, it's that's the root. Like you have a tree and I'm, I'm very visual. So you have a tree, the family is that root. And from those roots grow productive adults who can then do things and, and work and be productive and, and add back to society, right? So if you are a millionaire and you're like, you know, I want something, I want to put my money where I know it's going to, you know, go somewhere. You know, a dollar sown in family sport impacts many, many families, right? So you put $2, that's even double that. And then you move on and move on and move on. So you do that because we are all part of the family. And I think one of the things that led me to family sport in the beginning was this idea of at any given time, any, any family, any one of us could be part of a family that becomes fragile. Maybe a parent loses a job. Maybe there's a trauma that occurs. Maybe you just realize that, you know, what you, what your mama taught you is not working into, you know, with these children right. today. Like parenting right. has shifted, the model of parenting has shifted over time. Sure. Um, and so some folks, some parents may feel ill-equipped and they resort to tactics and, and parenting models that aren't the best, right? There's some holes with that. And so if you're able to go on our website and check out all the services that we do, then you will see where it's like your money goes far. Like it's not just $1 for $1. $1 can hit many, many lives. And so the multiplication factor and the exponential factor of your impact of those dollars is really important. Um, and you, you give because it's the right thing to do. Right. It's really, it's a heart thing. Like people give from their heart. So if you're passionate about families, if you're passionate about protecting children, if you're passionate about making sure that parents are outfitted with the best tools and resources to be the best parents they can be, this is why you give to, to families for it. Because you're gonna make a difference two generations at a time. Not only the child will be impacted positively by getting new resources and access to things, but the parent does too. And you can break that cycle of dysfunction. You can break that cycle of not knowing how to do because now you've got access to resources and those resources comes from monies and, and funding so that we can do and put people in place to kind of be you know, fill that gap for the families that need it that's what so, i would that's what i would do. so here's my last question for you you've done yes, a fantastic sir. job I've, I've put you on a put you on the hot <laughs> put you on the hot seat right off right right off yeah, the bat <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's been a wonderful conversation when i speak to women who are professionals and their moms, you know, they might be co-parenting, they might be single moms. One of the things that always mm -hmm. comes up is the sacrifices that have to be made and the choices that have to be made. And whether you have a team of people who are very supportive or, or not really makes a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. And then it inevitably ends up, we have, an, we have a conversation about a self-care. So as a healthcare professional, tell us about your self-care. Well, let's go for it. So I block time <laughs> because right now in this virtual space, I am working full time and I've got three children. And as you heard of the dog, they all require me 24 hours, right? Yeah. So depending on where I am in the day, I block time where it's just mommy is going to go in to the bathroom, I'm going to go in the bathroom and I'm just going to have silence for like 10 minutes. Okay. That's self-care, right? Or when the, the children are able to visit grandparents or you know do other things, then that's another piece of self-care. And so I've learned that it's okay to take it. I'm not being a bad person if I do. Um, and it has to be a you know kind of a fair and balanced approach. So I block time throughout the day to kind of give myself a break give the kids a break. Um, I pray, I do a lot of prayer. Me and Jesus are like <laughs> super close. 
I know he knows him all well. about me. I, I, you know, he and I have an intimate relationship as well. I feel me. like you know, maybe not as close as mine. I feel like I'm kind of an inner in. To I don't Jesus know. Right now, I, don't know. I feel like my in is a little bit more in than yours. No, I don't know. we not, had to talk about. I can't judge. It. It. We about might it offline. offline. Yeah, <laughs> don't want to say my Jesus. Yeah, I can't say for sure, but I definitely I'm pray. <laughs> pray. <laughs> um, I do yoga a little bit, not a whole lot, but I try. Um, and so, and then you know, just not taking myself so seriously, like you said, having fun, finding joy in the moments is good. So, you know, if I'm on a, a call and the dog's barking and the four-year-old's in the pantry and she's pulled out all the food, either you can get upset or you can just laugh and say, you know what, if you're going to eat it, yeah, that's your snack. <laughs> and you and the dog have sure, it. Right, you just do that <laughs> and, and then I'll get back to you after the call because that's right. also happening. So I've learned to not take myself so seriously finding joy, do dance breaks. Like right now, my kids are Fortnite aficionados and there's Fortnite yeah. dances, people. I know some dances. Oh. So we, oh, we do wow. like a Fortnite battle off, you know, pop and lock in with the Fortnite characters. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Just a little bit of I this. Can see it. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a visual person as well, so I can see the so just kind of the little music yeah. you're like yes and so that's been fun so we <laughs> learn to be creative right you have to be flexible and you know just find the joy so every day i'm like where's the joy and sometimes it doesn't come till 10 o'clock at night but it counts because then you can yes. go to sleep happy and then wake up ready to take on the day with all awesome. that comes with it yeah that is awesome so uh, jamia we have a tradition here on black lives matter radio show and our tradition is that after you get off the hot seat with me, the last question or questions for the evening come from Hope. So I'm going to turn over to Hope to ask you her questions and, and close it out for us. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jamia. This has just been so fabulous. Um, I'm here in uh, New Mexico and the light is coming in really bright. So you are getting a little bit of New Mexico sunset. Um, you are truly a, an amazing woman, right? One of our truly amazing women. And I have to give a shout out to our friend, Amy Steinler, who's a Martha Beck trained life coach. Every Monday, she has a meditation. And we met during one a couple of weeks ago. And I just thought, you have to come on the show, meet Tony. It's just too, too cool, too important. So my last question to you is, um, tell us, as a truly amazing woman, woman you know, you, um, you told me as we were chatting before, before today um, how hard it was as a kid to be the only Black brown person in the in the room and that really that touched my heart you know um, I don't think that enough people can understand what that must mm -hmm. be like so could you share some of that with our with our listeners yeah it was a very interesting space and I remember the first time that I realized that I was the only you know black person in the space we were on a field trip to like the state fair this is in Richmond so the state fair you know was a, was a thing and so all the all the schools win and you're looking at the farm animals and whatever. And I remember walking, you know, in, you know, in lined up. And so there was a black couple kind of, you know, adjacent to me. And so I guess they were like, oh, poor little black girl. They, they were kind of, it was that, that was a tone. And I remember she was like, oh, that's the only fly in the bunch. And I stopped and I remember stopping because I was like, I'm not a fly. And I remember turning around because I, I just, my mouth is just, oh. <laughs> and I was probably nine. And I remember, because I was so enraged. I was like, how dare she call me a fly? I'm not a fly. I'm cool. Got these cool glitter sneakers on. I'm at the state fair with my friends. Like, who does she think she is? So I remember, like, <clears throat> and I turned around and I said, I'm not a fly, I'm Mia. Because that's, well, that was my name. You know, that's also my, like, my nickname. And the, the Black lady said, all right, don't you forget it. And so in that moment, we recognized this moment of, don't forget who you are. And I think she was kind of like proud that I A, spoke up. And then I felt bad, like, oh my gosh, I just talked to a stranger. You're not supposed to do that, stranger danger. And I'm yelling at a stranger about right. who, and gave my whole name and all that. But she was like, don't you forget <laughs> it. And so, you know, and of course, the other kids stopped because you know, I was walking and I stopped and you know, had this moment with the stranger. And so um, she just said, don't forget it. And I was like, you know what, I won't. Because I know who I am. And even if I'm the only Black girl in the class, they're going to know who I am. And I remember thinking I wasn't embarrassed to be the only Black person. Because I was Mia. And I was just going to do whatever I'm going to do, whether you like me or not. 
going and we went on to the to see the cow exhibit and saw uh, the calf got you know got born right there on the fair which was pretty wow. neat. so that was cool but i mean but that moment i was like i'm not a fly and after that i never I never looked at it as a lesser than. It was just, if I'm the only one in the room, you're gonna know it, right, wrong, or, or otherwise. So that's, and after that, it, I, was, I was aware of it, but it didn't bother me as much because I'm Mia and I'm gonna be here and you're gonna know that I'm here. So I kind of turned, I kind of made it like a, a, a battle cry. So. That's amazing. Yeah, and that's you know that's a, that's a message for all people, right? No matter who you are, to be proud of who you are, irregardless. And um, that's it's such an honor to be able to do this show with Tony and bring uh, just amazing people together. He's such a fantastic interviewer and has as a, a, a so to share with the world your your big success today, Tony. Oh my goodness, it's so not about me, but since you put me on the spot. Um, Today, uh, I woke up really early in the morning and I was able to complete exa an exam that will allow me to uh, attain uh, an ICF cr credential, International Coaching Federation credential. Uh, so very, very happy about that. And uh, once ICF reviews everything and, and, and gives me my credential, I'll be able to really uh, kind of spread my wings and, and prayerfully, uh, offer my assistance, offer my coaching skills to organizations like uh, Families Forward uh, to assist in making sure that all the families represented in that group, all the services that are represented are used and uh, utilized at a level that continues to build that bridge in the community. Congratulations, that's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So, that is thank you so hard thank on you. that and worked uh, just, you know, 100 hours of coaching. So I, we had to give a shout out on January 24th to accomplish such an amazing goal and to share it with you. We're so thrilled to know you, Jamina, and we look that's forward to great. sharing um, what you're doing. And as you grow in this new role, uh, let yeah. us know sure how we can help you, support you. Um, it's I, You know, you said you hit two generations when you help fund mm -hmm. this organization. And I would say you hit even more than that because then the pay it forward is, you know, yeah. the generations to come. And that's Absolutely. mission critical for all of us. We are all mm -hmm. in this together, right? Yeah, and, and we're now, all family. Yeah, yeah. We're all yes, family. we are. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that cornbread. <laughs> Me too. My <laughs> cornbread <laughs> is stuff of legend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, thank you both for sharing your thoughts you. um, and all of our listeners live on Facebook and on yeah. Incandescent Radio's Black Lives Matter radio show and on Incandescent TV, blacklivesmatterTV.us is the URL where you can watch these videos again. So we thank you. We wish you well. We stay healthy and we will talk to you again next Sunday night, 6 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm.